Welcome everyone to, to this presentation of uh, the code base and the development environment around GEFI. My name is, uh, is Matthew Bastian. Uh, I'll walk you through this, uh, this today and really no, no prior knowledge is, is required. Um, at the end of this presentation, you, you can kind of navigate GEFI, get, get your way around into the code base. Hopefully we'll actually switch from the presentation to to my IDE here. So we'll also go um, sometimes into the code to, to sit um, you know, beyond the presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll start with an introduction of, uh, of the architecture and some of the principles uh, behind the, um, the design of, of the software. And then we'll move into one of the most important part is the, the APIs. That's kind of your entry point to the, to the functionality. Uh, I was talking about the, the building part, um, so what uh, the automation around uh, testing the software and releasing it. Um, and finally, a bit about the you know, local environment to, to develop. So I want to start with the architecture. So as you may know, uh, Gephi is based on the uh, Java programming language. And we're currently uh, using uh, Java 11. Uh, and then on top of, of Java, there is the NetBeans platform. So this uh, NetBeans platform is um, you know, creating um, foundations for many of the functionalities. It actually is uh, also the foundation of which the NetBeans IDE is uh, based on. We'll go more into details of, of what is uh, NetBeans platform and, and the features it offers in this presentation. It's important because basically you, once you get to know the Gephi code base, you will also see NetBeans uh, APIs being used, right? So um, some knowledge about the platform is needed if you want to, to modify Gephi's code base. On top of that, we have the uh, core Gephi modules, and these are actually um, separated from the uh, user interface modules. The reason behind this um, is that you could create a command line tool uh, with only the um, modules that are not the user interface. Uh, actually, we, we've done that. It's called the toolkit. So Gephi can be used as part of a, of a library using the Gephi toolkit. And for that, we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we, we keep the user interface modules separate so you do not have to, to import any unnecessary modules uh, um, as part of, uh, of your library. And then on top of the core modules and the user interface modules, um, one can build plugins. You may know that Gephi has this extensible uh, architecture and plugins can be, you know, on any, using any of the existing modules, could be on the, on the core, could be on the UI. Cool, now the, the principles. Uh, I wanna introduce you to two very important principles um, behind the, the design. The first one is, is the modularity of it. So the, the idea of Gephi is to be extensible. And in fact, the code is broken down into 63 modules. And these modules um, can defend, define dependencies between, between them. So that the idea is if you want to get started modifying um, you know, one functionality, you can easily find your way into the module that is responsible for this feature. And you do not have to know the entire code base, uh, you can kind of just get into this module, make your change, and um, there are APIs and contracts between, uh, between modules. And very importantly, plugins are actually nothing else than, than modules. So if you were to create a, a new plugin for Gephi, you would actually, behind the scene, create a 64th module um, in, into the software. So there's no nothing really custom about plugins, they're just another module and that's, uh, that's quite uh, important. The, the second principle is the, the multi-threading. Um, there is, a, I think, a, a user motivation behind it. We, we wanted to, to create a user interface that is uh, not blocking, that things can run in the background and we don't stop the, the user uh, exploring the graph while maybe some algorithms are running in the background. That also means, um, we needed to, to have a way to keep the graph structure consistent. And that is currently done via some locking. 
So to give you an example, if, uh, if I delete a node in my graph, um, we also need to delete the edges associated with this node. Otherwise, the graph structure is not consistent. So it wouldn't make sense that one thread um, you know, deletes a node and then another thread uh, reads the edges and the edges of the node that was just deleted uh, were still present. So um, all of that is done via, via locking. The graph structure um, you know, kind of works a bit like a database. Um, you know, database have um, consistency controls and uh, that's the same for our uh, structure, which is in memory. So you, can't, uh, you can rely on, on, on the graph being uh, consistent at any point in time. And then the, the idea of multi-threading goes, goes also into the user interface. Um, it's kind of, uh, there's an assumption in, in, in the software that at any point in time, a module, a, a plugin can, can modify the graph. And the other modules should be reacting to these changes. So that, for example, if you, if you do a change to the graph, you do not have to think that you have to refresh this user interface or this user interface. They will um, do that automatically. And, and that is a, is a way to keep modules separate, but also to, um, to be you know, scaling. You know, we don't want to, to have um, a user interface that's, that's very, very slow if many, many changes are happening in the same time. A quick overview of the technologies we use. As said, we, we use Java uh, currently, the um, JDK 11. We have plans to, to move to the uh, JDK 17. Um, there's still some work to, to, be, to be done over there, but that's um, you know, kind of a foundation for us. NetBeans platform, um, what do they offer? They offer, I mean, I'm just stating the, the most obvious examples. There are, of course, many functionalities in NetBeans platform, but we do have a module system. We have a docking framework. Uh, so the you know, moving windows around, all of that is, is given by uh, NetBeans platform. And then they have cool uh, auto update functionalities um, to, to keep updating the software as the new versions uh, come in and many, many more things. Many user interface components actually um, uh, obtained from NetBeans. And it's, um, yeah, I wanna give a shout out to, to the NetBeans uh, team. They, they have um, all of this platform in, in open source and uh, there's, a, there's a vibrant community around it. Many other desktop software are, are based on it. And we definitely uh, um, you know, could go fast thanks to, thanks to their platform. On the user interface side, we use uh, Swing and for the visualization, uh, OpenGL. And for the preview, so the uh, visualization on the preview um, tab, uh, we use Java 2D. For the building and automation side, everything is based on Maven and JUnit for uh, unit testing and then uh, GitHub Actions for uh, building and releasing. We'll have a section on that uh, afterwards. Cool, APIs. So let's uh, talk about the, the main APIs of Gethin and uh, then a bit about uh, how they work. So every functionality is, is covered um, within an API and this corresponds to, to actual uh, modules. So if I go on my IDE, you know, you, you can see those, uh, those modules, they, are, they have these names, right? So project API, that's the API responsible for the project management, the workspaces. Then we have the graph API, that's where the, the graph structure is. And uh, that's how you access your, your graph data. Import API, if you go into the file open, if you manipulate files or databases, you will go uh, through the import API. Layout API for layout algorithms. Filters. Statistics is for the, all the other algorithms like community detection, page rank, and so on and so forth. Export to export files. Uh, preview, that's to uh, render the preview um, image. Appearance the module that uh, allows you to partition and, and rank, transform the, the elements, nodes, edges in, with colors and sizes. 
Then we have the tools um, that are associated with your visualization, like the shortest path, for example. Then, of course, the data laboratory, all the manipulation on the attributes. And then finally, the visualization API that um, the OpenGL uh, engine offers. So as said, each of these APIs uh, can have dependencies with each other. So as an example, the graph API, if I go into the code and I look for this module and I look into the Maven configuration file, basically dependencies are defined in this, in this uh, POM XML file, Maven configuration uh, files. And you can see that right here, we do have a dependency on the project API. So in order for the graph to work, it's associated with workspaces. So we do need access to the project API. Uh, and this is how it's, uh, it's defined. This is nothing else than classic Maven dependencies. So there's nothing fancy about it. Um, and this is where, if you were to add new dependencies to your module, you will, you will need to go to. There is a one of these uh, POM XML file per module, basically. So that's the main APIs uh, of Gephi, and we'll go a little bit more into what they are, what are their properties. They really are you know, very plain Java interfaces. So if I were to go into the import API, um, the one responsible for importing files and databases, and I look into its content, here I'm in the import API folder. I can find you know, classic Java interfaces, container, and so on and so forth, as an example. Um, public packages, that's an important concept that the um, NetBeans module system offers. I will show you uh, how to also change it. There is um, certain packages that you can set as public. And these are the packages that other modules will have access to. I'll, I'll walk you through an example. Most of our APIs have reached uh, stability uh, where we do aim for backward compatibility, but we can kind of say, okay, this one is under development and don't expect, uh, we're kind of still working our way through uh, refining the, um, the entry points and the APIs. And then, um, you know, Ideally, they reach stability and, and you can kind of build plugins on top of it and expect these to be, uh, to be stable over time. And yeah, documentation via the classic Java doc is available and should be um, you know, complete for all the, all the main APIs. That's, that's the goal. Not always uh, the best um, of quality in certain places, but um, certainly in most cases you have an entry point you can rely on. So taking an example of import API again, that's my module. Um, we have a public package. It ends with this dot API, the one I just showed you. And then they can be within the same module, the actual implementation of this API. So if I go back to my IDE, there's just another folder. Each here we have the import container imp. It does import, uh, implements the container. So within the same module, I can play with the API, I can play with the implementation. It's not in separate modules, but only the API is in the public package. So um, there could be also other, other things. If another module were to depend on import API, they will not be able to actually access the implementation. That's very important because the idea of an API is that you hide the implementation details and you can, if, if you want, replace this implementation later on. So we don't want another module to, to start uh, depending on the implementation details that could be replaced later on. It's really this idea of a contract, same for web APIs. You want the API to be, um, to be offered to, to other modules and, uh, and that's it, no, no other um, uh, access allowed. Since Java 9 and the module uh, systems, this has also kind of uh, um, been offered to outside of NetBeans as part of the, of the JDK um, in, a, in a similar flavor. But uh, yeah, the NetBeans platform is 
is uh, exists uh, for much longer time than Java 9. So they, they kind of came up with the system of public packages. You can define those public packages again in the pom file. Um, they're listed here. So they're yeah, fairly, fairly easy to, to say these are the API, the, the, the packages that will be accessible by other modules. Again, that's in the POM file a bit down below. And that should be, uh, it could also be empty, right? There could be nothing. Uh, that's also fine. As an introduction to, to API design, I actually do recommend this book, Practical API Design. It's actually written by the architect of NetBeans platform and has inspired us uh, heavily. Uh, it's, it's an excellent uh, way to, to, to get into that, uh, that domain at a, at a higher level, so I highly recommend it. Cool, now let's talk about SPIs. Yeah. SPI means uh, Service Provider Interface. And I'll spend some time here because uh, as, a, as a newbie, this can create confusion, um, but once you get used to it, it's, it's very, very simple. SPIs in, in Gephi are the ones that are meant to be extended. And at the end of the day, they have the same properties than APIs. They don't have the same role, but they never mixed with APIs. Taking an example again of import API, as I said, we have our API piece. That's the one that other modules can depend on. And then we have the implementation um, in another uh, package. And then we have the SPI package. And within the SPI, for example, we could have a, a, an importer interface. And then this importer interface uh, is meant to be extended by every importer, for example, importer GXF, importer GML, or whatever other uh, implementation uh, of um, files we, we might come up with. And this implementation can be part of uh, core Gephi modules, but they could also be part of your plugin. Basically, your plugin will uh, implement this interface. We'll go into that example quickly. Also in the IDE. So in the SPI folder here, you have all these interfaces that are supposed to be implemented by plugins and whatever functionalities to import. So they will need to have a way to execute and so on and so forth. So these SPIs are um, also Java interfaces. They're also backward compatible. They're also, um, you know, kind of controlled via the public packages. So kind of the same idea, but really um, they, they offer those functionalities to, um, to be extended. What are the SPIs we, we have today in Gephi? That's uh, the purpose of this slide. We have the import SPI, I just show it to you. So this is how file databases and uh, wizard importers are defined. We have layouts, we have statistics AP, SPI, tools SPI, project SPI. This is also where the persistence providers are implemented. So you may know that in Gephi, you can save your project into a .gephi file. And this is extensible. So any module can uh, add its uh, data into this .gephi file by implementing a persistence provider. So that is uh, the SPI of the project. And then, of course, export, filters, preview, generators, data laboratory, appearance and uh, visualization. The visualization SPI is currently very limited. We, we have a, a project to, to re, revamp the uh, visualization engine that will offer also more functionality via the, via the SPI. So what you have here on the screen are essentially all the kinds of plugins you can create today, right? So plugins can only exist if they, if they implement uh, uh, an SPI. So I know this can be a bit confusing. So let's let's recap. Um, APIs offer functionality to other modules. SPIs are the one meant to be extended. Plugins always expand, uh, extend an SPI. And then both should actually be clearly documented. And we do keep track of um, these API SPI changes 
in the main uh, overview page of our of our Java doc. So if we make changes over there, um, and you need to migrate your um, plugin or module, you get uh, you get you know the change log basically of the of the API, um, and that's um, yeah a way to to keep track of uh, of what has changed, what are the new methods, and so on and so forth. And this is the time to introduce uh, Lookup. Lookup is the most important uh, NetBeans platform uh, utility that you will see those, those kind of uh, lines of code in, in very, very, uh, in, in many, many places. And there are two important Lookup uh, uh, function that I will introduce you to, and they are related to the, to the API and SPI discussion. The first one is the uh, lookup that um, essentially finds the instance of um, of an of an interface, and here, as an example, we are aiming to manipulate our projects. So, for example, creating a new project or uh, saving it or whatever, and we need to do that uh, via the project controller. So that's the interface which would have those functions. You can take a look at it actually. Uh, this is in the project API. So a project controller might have a new project. So you want to manipulate this. And um, the lookup allows you to obtain the implementation of that controller without having to know um, to, to have access to actual the implementation itself. So you obtain the instance uh, of that service um, and you do that via lookup. If you're familiar with uh, dependency injection um, and yeah, annotation in, in web services, this is very, very similar. Um, the service is a, uh, is a singleton and doing this lookup allows you to um, respect the API um, and implementation separation. Then the second call um, is the lookup all. And this is very important as well. If you have, uh, for example, a renderer, so the renderer is in the preview API, sorry, SPI. So the, uh, uh, we have an SPI for a renderer. So the ID in the preview domain for a render is to provide some functionality to render some objects. And at some point in the, in the code, we'll need to retrieve all the implementation of renderers. And we'll do that through the lookup all. So instead of obtaining a single class, um, like the example above, we obtain a list or collection of all the, the renderers. And these could be renderers implemented in plugins, could be renderers implemented in the core modules, it doesn't matter. This is um, at runtime, um, adding new implementation of a renderer would then uh, return it uh, in, in addition of the other ones in this lookup all. We can take a look at the actual uh, implementation of those renderers as a quick, uh, so that's, we'll get back to that, but that's in a separate module. Here we have the node renderer, and you can see that it does implement the SPI. So we basically say, okay, I'm offering a new functionality. It's called the node renderer. It implements a renderer. And uh, the um, Gephi can find all of these renderers without having to know them um, by uh, their package uh, specifically. How does this work behind the scene is through uh, an SPI annotation. So if I go back to my node render example, you can see that this annotation is, is above the service provider annotation. And basically what I'm saying here is that this class implements a renderer and offers uh, a new implementation of the render SPI and the lookup uh, behind the scene, we'll find all the class 
in your class pass that implement this annotation. And that's how I will find uh, I will find it. If I if I would create just a renderer about uh, how Gephi knows about new renderers, right? So if I were just to, to write this class, omitting the annotation, um, this lookup all call would miss my uh, my node renderer. So it's essential to add this uh, as well. So any any new layouts, any new filters, any new renderers. Um, basically can be added with implementing the SPI, adding this annotation, and here you go. That's all you have to do. Um, and this is how you extend the, the functionalities of, uh, of Gephi. In the user interface, for example, when you, when you uh, go into Gephi and you want to select a layout, you have this drop down basically, right? So you can, I can select Foresight Class 2, I can select, you know, uh, Fushtum and Rheingold, all these layout algorithms. Right, so this drop down at behind the scene would do this call to look up all. It says, okay, what are all the, the layout algorithms that are currently in my uh, Java class path? Find them all, and then we'll list them in this drop down. That's essentially, um, you know, pretty much everywhere where you have a file menu to export, where you select um, a renderer, when you select a layout or filters. All of these are usually uh, in lists or trees. And essentially this list and trees are powered by the lookup all called behind the scene to find those implementation in, at runtime. There are more resources on lookup. I put a link down there in the NetBeans platform documentation. And also in, the, in, 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 book, in this book, I recommend that they, they also talk about it. So uh, more about the future. So APIs is a, it's kind of a long-term contract, right? So I think it's nice to say where we, what we want to preserve, right? What we've achieved, they want to preserve for, for new developers. So in general, for every feature, we want to have that stable and clean and documented API so that, um, you know, we, we can have a, a very, very nice discovery moment, right? So you, you kind of have the idea of extending preview and you don't need to, to go too much into the code. You can start from the, the Java doc and read you, your, your way through and everything is very clear. That's the goal. Um, of course, implementation can be replaced. That's the core principle of uh, API uh, design. It has happened actually many times in, in Gephi's history that we rewrote completely uh, underneath modules uh, with better implementation without uh, altering the, the API uh, or not altering it too much. And uh, that will continue uh, in the future. In fact, you can even, if you were to write a better version of a project controller, the lookup and NetBeans platform capability, you can also replace an implementation. That's not so known, but if you were to write a better project controller, you could say, this is my new uh, implementation and, and set it as a higher priority. And it will actually replace the existing, the, the, the default implementation. So you can not only extend Gephi, but you could also replace existing implementation. In practice, that does not really uh, happen, but it's worth mentioning, you get the idea of how powerful this, uh, this capability is. And yeah, of course, APIs, uh, SPIs allow you to, to add new features. And we want to continue to make that separation between the uh, um, you know, core modules and the uh, user interface modules. So some, uh, that can be sometimes tricky because of course, when you design a feature um, you know, that needs some user input, you need to have some, some user interface. And um, modules themselves can be reused in other projects. And that is, um, actually done automatically for you. If you go to, to Maven Central and search for Giphy, you will find all of its modules. So if you were to build a, a third party application, like a cloud application or whatever, a library, and you just need certain Giphy modules, maybe just a graph structure, maybe the, plus the layout, you can pick and choose the modules you want. And this, this can serve other, other applications um, that um, you know, serve other purposes. We, we have uh, also the 
goal of, of providing clarity towards the uh, users and developers of what we change and use a semantic versioning. So if you, if you do a, a patch version, you can kind of expect minimal API changes. Maybe we add a, a new method to an API, but that's, that's it. For, for minor versions, we might want to, to add new APIs and occasionally breaking the compatibility when really, really necessary, especially for, uh, for under development APIs. And for major versions, um, so 1.0 and, and beyond, there we can kind of expect that from a 1.0 to a 2.0, we could completely rewrite APIs from scratch with, with major changes. Um, code structure. Start with the, the anatomy of a module. So as I said, we have uh, 63 modules and they're all you know, follow the same structure and it's good to know uh, what things mean. And there is then the first, the, the module name, the uh, source slash main slash Java would be the source. Then you have additional resources. That's quite important. Um, classic in Java, but this is where you would uh, find your localization files, any additional files or icons or images, whatever, that's all based in the resource folder. And then all the tests uh, will be in the uh, in the test folder, and then very important the the POM XML file would uh, contains your configuration such as dependencies, public packages, and uh, or whatnot. So every module uh, would have those uh, those files, and uh, when you create a new um, module for Gephi, basically you you get um, you know this kind of Maven like structure. Um, and it, it follows the, the Maven uh, conventions. Talking about conventions, um, if you browse the, the code base, you will find modules such as import APIs, so they finish with API. Then you will find something like import plugin, import plugin UI, and then desktop import. And uh, I'm gonna explain you um, what is the role of each of these modules so that it will make your uh, navigation of, of the code base much easier. So the, the import API, as, a, as already explained in the examples, that's where you find the API, the SPIs, and the implementation of these APIs. There are one or two exceptions. For example, you can still find the filters implementation into this filters imp, but in the future, this uh, will try to wrap everything into the uh, import API both the API and its implementation. The import plugin is where we do have the SPI implementation. So this is where you would find your GEXF importer and so on and so forth. That uh, these two API and plugin actually are these core Gephi modules. So no user interface is defined in these two uh, module types. That's the, the one you need if you want to uh, have, for example, a command line application that is capable of importing um, all the file formats that Giphy supports. The SPI also has, um, you know, sometimes UI components. So you can not only add uh, functionality to Giphy, but you could also add UI panels, right? So if, uh, if, if an export or an import has, a, has the need to, to configure itself via yeah, user interface, you will also need to offer this user interface as part of an SPI, and this would be in the, in the import plugin uh, UI. So as an example here, um, all of the graph format that we have, they are not, uh, you don't have a panel to configure its import. The exception is the um, a spreadsheet, so there you have a whole wizard to import your CSV. We detect the, 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 the content and so on and so forth. So we need to have some UI code that um, implements the uh, importer UI. So again, an SPI, but only designed for the user interface. And then there's plenty of Java swing code here to, to, to do the actual um, uh, swing part. But that's, that's where you, that's why you need, uh, you know, some SPIs are uh, UI only. And 
for the reason I explained to, to separate the core and the UI modules, they are in separate, uh, separate modules. Um, and that's the uh, um, role of the plugin UI. And then finally, you have the desktop import. So this is all the remaining uh, UI code. So this is, for example, where you would find the uh, report panel, right? So when you import um, a file in Gephi, once, once the import is completed, you see this report, it tells you how many nodes, some errors and warnings. So this is something that is um, defined in the desktop import module. And as I told you, we have 63 modules in total. If you actually start counting all the modules that follow this, uh, this structure, you have 17 uh, API types modules, you have 11 plugin types modules, six plugin UI modules and 15 desktop um, plugin modules. So in total, you have 49 modules that actually follow this uh, convention. So, you know, you could, you could pick one other API, layout API, there's a layout plugin. Preview API, there is a preview plugin module. Statistics API, you have a statistics plugin, you have a statistics plugin UI, and you have a desktop statistic plugin. So it's kind of, um, once you know these four, you, you can um, reason about the different modules much, much, uh, much more easily. And the remaining are other things um, that, um, you know, modules, for example, to the welcome screen is another module or the things that update the settings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they, they kind of, for the most part, follow this, uh, this convention. This convention also um, then translates into package names. And that's uh, something you can uh, you know, keep in mind when you create new um, modules or make changes to the implementation. We, we try to, to stick to those uh, package names uh, to keep things um, you know, tidy. Then, Diving into into you know we saw this project controller. I think it's good to understand a bit also the some conventions around that. You may be familiar with the model view controller pattern. Gephi um, you know has a more of a model controller pattern, so there's not really a view, so it's a bit simpler. And um, there are some controllers, and these are always a singleton found via lookup. So we saw the project controller. You also have the import controller, the uh, graph controller, and so on and so forth. So these controllers are entry points for um, for, for 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 um, interacting with that module. So this is where you would find uh, the core functions to um, to operate and and to execute the the features. They are always singleton services, and you can always find them in the lookup. Uh, as I said, this is the entry point for any alteration, any setters are in the controller. And um, this is also where you can retrieve the models. And I'll explain you what the models are. This is uh, where all of your states are and data is located. And very important, uh, they, there is one model per workspace. So you know that Gephi has a, a, you know, a project structure and within that project, you have some workspaces and each workspace is, is independent of other workspaces. So if you have configuration about your filters, for example, in workspace one, and you switch to workspace two, um, then the uh, configuration of your filters is changed, right? And then if you go back to, uh, to one, you retrieve the settings you had for, for workspace one. In practice, that means that essentially Within which, uh, within which workspace you have a layout model, a filter model, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, these are um, you know, basically accessible from the controller. The controller can tell you what is the current workspace uh, model, access um, the model from, uh, from there. And the models are also the source uh, for persistence providers. I explained a bit the earlier that within the Gephi project file, the .gephi, you have the ability 
for a module to enter its data. So this is, for example, how you would be able to save the layout configuration when you save a, a file in Gephi. We, we basically behind the scene ask all implementation of persistence provider, there is a layout persistence provider that will write some um, states into, into the uh, Gephi file and will be able to retrieve its state as well when they are read. So this is your kind of serialization source. That's the model. And um, this is where all of your data uh, is. So in summary, the models are the getters. This is where you get all the data. The controller, this is where you set all of the states and data. And there's no view um, in, in, the, in the current uh, architecture. Look um, at the repository, quick look. If you, if you clone Gephi on, uh, on GitHub, from GitHub, sorry, you will, you will find this structure. So it's worth explaining quickly um, what, what are you seeing. In the, in the top folder, you have a, um, you know, that's a bit of a convention. We need to save the GitHub actions as file as part of the dot GitHub slash workflows. We can take a look at it afterwards. And then all of these six to C modules, all the code base is within the modules folder. But there's one module that's a bit different um, that, that you need to know about. It's the application one. So this is the actual um, Giphy application that um, has dependencies of the all other modules. So in, in the NetBeans platform convention, you have um, modules and then applications. And back to your question of, could we create another application with a, with a subset of modules? Yes, that would mean that we have another application module. We have only one in Gephi, that's the Gephi app. And um, that's where you have more like configurations there's not really any code in there. It's more like configurations about, you know, the the, the branding screen and then the versions and, and some installer based uh, configurations. So there's a lot in there. I'm not going to go too much into details, um, but it, it's worth noting that this this exists and also important for for building. Um, then the source folder actually is not so interesting. It, it has some extra files like the macOS launcher and a few other things. Um, so not really, not really relevant for, for developers day to day. The uh, POM XML at the root is very important. Uh, we can take a look at it. It has, uh, uh, it, it acts as a, as a parent. So Maven has this, uh, this, this concept of multi-module uh, repositories and that's basically what we are. And also uh, as a convention, we try to keep, uh, I'm gonna take, show you, we try to keep all the configuration as part of this uh, parent uh, POM. So, you know, whatever we need to configure, um, you know, some versions of dependencies, some things for um, building, everything is into this properties here of the Gephi parent. And every module um, essentially uses this um, parent so they have access to its um, configuration. So they in inherit this configuration, in other words, that's achieved with this um, you know, classic parent um, into the Maven configuration file. So if you, if you look for um, configurations, they are most likely in directly in the, in the parent. Sometimes they, um, when they are very specific, they could also be part of the, uh, POM XML of the module itself. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, uncommon. We'll move to the final part of the, of the presentation, how Gephi is built and, and released. And the building architecture is, is fairly simple and automated. Um, we have a, a master branch and when you commit to that branch, uh, we trigger a GitHub action called build and test. It will build Gephi and run all of the tests. And if successful, um, you know, that, that means that most likely you have not introduced a regression. If you develop a new feature, you can have a feature branch do a pull request, um, 
and that follows the same um, path, then the pull request runs the tests. And if those are successful, the uh, pull request can be merged. So that is the day-to-day -day master branch, feature branch uh, workflow. We also have release branches. So when we decide to create a new release, for example, 097, we would create a release branch. And the uh, GitHub um, workflow, the GitHub Actions workflow then differ. There is um, then a release workflow that is doing a lot more. Uh, it will also run the build and test. So that's basically where the two overlap, but it will also produce the artifacts and upload them to, to Maven Central. Let me, let me give you an example. If you go to, to Maven Central, um, when we build Gaffey, um, all of its artifacts are uh, uploaded and you can see all of these modules that uh, we talked about, statistics API, project API, all of these for every version. When we run the release workflow, it's um, artifacts, the jar and the NBM, which is an NetBeans uh, module uh, file format. Everything is uploaded to Maven Central. Uh, that also includes the actual uh, binary of the um, of the app. So this is the, the you know, Gephi without anything else. Here you would find the Linux version, the Windows version, the Mac version, and so on and so forth. We, as part of the release workflow, we also update the auto update site. Let me introduce you to to what uh, how that works a bit. When you when you are in um, in Gafe, you can be prompted to update to a new version. Behind the scene, uh, this actually queries um, an XML file on our GitHub pages. And if there is a new uh, version, we need to kind of refresh that XML file with the path of the new modules. So from zero point six. Uh, 96 to 0 0.97. So there is a there is a automated update of this uh, XML file and modules as part of the uh, auto update um, step of the release branch. What's important to note is that um, for this release workflow, we follow exactly the same process, whether it is a development release or a, a, a final release. The only difference is, uh, and that's a Maven convention, we have not invented it. If the version name contains a snapshot, is finished by snapshot, it's development release. If it's not, then it's a final release. A development releases, we can do as many as we want. Uh, we can kind of overwrite if you like. Um, I can show you how this looks like, in fact. Um, you know, this, this little five here, this gets incremented basically. So every time you do a new development release, um, you have a new um, a latest version of the, of the uh, binaries. For a final release, this is not possible. Once you've done a, a final release for 0 0.9.7, you cannot overwrite your binaries. You have to do a new version 0 0.9.8. Uh, so that's the, the, only, uh, the only important difference. Talking a bit more about releasing Gephi, it's uh, it's entirely automated with um, the GitHub Actions. So reminder, if I commit to a release branch and my um, Maven configuration files do not contain snapshot, it will actually release um, the new version to Maven Central and you can find them um, there. So there is a different path when it contains snapshots here, these are the development versions. These uh, pass Maven Central are the final versions. So you can find the binaries here for the latest version. If you um, download Gephi, uh, essentially this is where you get your uh, binaries. And again, we, we update the uh, auto-update site as well, so that if you, open Gephi uh, and your current version is 0 0.9.6. You do not need 
to reinstall Gephi to obtain the latest version, you will be prompted to update the 0 0.97. Uh, and that is done through the uh, auto update. I can show you how this works a bit in practice. Um, if you go to our Gephi repository, to the GitHub pages, and here, this is the XML file that NetBeans platform will query to obtain um, you know, whether they are up to date or not. So in this XML file, it lists all the modules that Gephi requires and uh, their current version. So this is the behind the scene um, uh, resources for Gephi to know whether its current modules are at the latest version or not. And you can see that the latest commit is a, a commit coming from GitHub Actions. So this uh, is automated. And as I'm here, I can show you the actual workflow. So here in the, in the GitHub Actions uh, tab of the, of the repository, I can find the build and test. So that's the one run for day-to-day -day master branch and then the release. And the release path has this kind of matrix where we need to run for multiple OS. And uh, that's um, then done in parallel. And as I said, at the end, you have this up update site uh, task as well. Um, there are only two manual steps in this whole workflow is to actually change the version in the POM file. So move from snapshot to not snapshot. So that is not automated. And then one has to you know, still uh, create the actual release here manually. So the, you know, that's something that we still have to do by hand, but everything else is automated. A little bit, little bit more details. As I said, it's a, it's a matrix build uh, with one job per OS and architecture. We currently uh, follow um, uh, support four, um, but it could be that uh, we, we can add more as architecture and, and OS uh, um, continues to, uh, to develop. For each of these uh, OS and architecture, we embed uh, GRE, so we download uh, from um, from the trusted sources, the latest GRE for each um, OS. So for example, uh, Windows um, with 64 bits, we, we have a specific GRE for that. We download that as part of the release process, put it into the uh, um, uh, uh, binary so that when you run Gephi, you do not need to install Java beforehand. Um, as I said, the workflow depends on the OS. There are um, quite a few things that we need to do for macOS specifically. So they have a pretty high bar when it comes to uh, security, code signing, app notarization, all of that uh, needs, to be, needs to be done as part of the uh, release process. So if you're not familiar with it, app notarization means that we actually send our uh, final uh, binary to, to Apple for verification. We wait about 10 minutes. If successful, um, you will actually be able to uh, run Gephi uh, on your Mac without having to tell you that this is a spyware, basically, that the, the, the so-called gatekeeper mechanism. Um, just to achieve that, uh, that state, you, you need to, to follow those steps. And fortunately, we have automated that uh, as part of the, of the release process. For Windows, we, we have an installer. And we use uh, you know, Setup, which is a um, popular open source uh, setup uh, for uh, installer platform. This is also um, run as part of the release process and uh, produce the, the final installer. There is a, a installer configuration um, configuration file in the code base that we can tweak with uh, uh, at ease. Um, yeah, that's, I think, almost it. Last, uh, last important um, tips and, and, and ways to get started in the local development. Um, we support two IDEs currently, NetBeans IDE and IntelliJ. 
and uh, we have provided documentation how to how to get started. Um, at the end of the day, nothing is really fancy. Um, there, NetBeans and IntelliJ recognize Giphy as a multi-module Maven project and use a Maven behind the scene for, for building and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the goal for, for new developers is to be able to uh, build and run and debug locally. It's very important that you have the kind of the breakpoints and then you can uh, you know, play with Gephi and then see the, uh, the debugging, uh, including unit tests. Um, unit tests uh, should be executed very quickly by the IDE. Um, so you can really get into this uh, test, um, you know, kind of test-driven development uh, where you, you start playing with tests first and you get, uh, um, you iterate your way through the functionality without having to run uh, Gephi, which of course takes time uh, to boot it up. So a few scenarios, if you are completely new to the code, you would need for the, for the first time you, you, you get Gephi um, imported by your IDE, you would need to kind of build all the modules. So you can do that in IntelliJ, for example, by taking the uh, topmost project folder, Gephi parent, and build it. Behind the scene, it will basically build all of the modules. Here, I have configured my uh, IDE to actually run what's so-called the parallel Maven build. So it's building on four threads at the same time. It makes everything go uh, quite a bit faster. You can configure that. So parallel Maven build is supported thanks to essentially the, the modular design, right? So modules depend on each other, builds, um, you know, it builds a, a tree. Um, of course, circular dependencies are not allowed. Therefore, uh, they, they are able to start with the modules at the top of the tree and then go down all the way and do that in, in parallel. Uh, the last module that's built is always the app. So the application also called the Gephi app. So that's the one that always is at the end because it depends, um, it has dependencies to every other module. So my build is successful. So, you know, I could go into, into the uh, run and I would be able to run Gephi based on a local, uh, local build. So that's your, your scenario if you're new to the code. If you start playing with, uh, with changes and you make change to a module, for example, you know, you change the uh, import API module and you want to test your changes. Um, you can do that immediately with, you have nothing to do. If you run unit tests, it will just work. It will take your changes in account. But if you want to run the actual Gephi, you will need to always make sure to rebuild the module that you have changed. So you can do that by just building that module. Behind the scene, what does actually do is that it will write, uh, it will overwrite your local copy of your uh, jar into your Maven local repository that you can find here in the .m2. So it's important that you do that step, otherwise, you're, you're gonna make some code changes, you're gonna run Gephi, and these code changes will still be based on the previous version. So that is uh, very important. If you uh, run locally, in addition, you need to also rebuild the application. So you make a change to um, a module, you rebuild that module, and then you rebuild the application, and that's all you have to do to make sure that when you run locally, uh, it will take in account your uh, latest changes. There you go. Um, that's, um, you know, something that you need to remember. If you're really unsure, you can kind of always rebuild everything. Uh, that's also a possibility, but it takes, of course, longer. Cool, I put some resources at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, to, to, to provide uh, pointers to, to documentation of uh, NetBeans platform, but also um, Gephi and other pieces. If you have um, yeah, any feedback about the presentation, of course, happy to hear and, uh, and uh, happy coding. <laughs>